Hello and welcome to Bethel Christian Ministries. My name's Melissa and I'm a part of the team here at BCM. Guys, I want you to press that like button, hit subscribe and share this post. Today's message was delivered by none other than one of my most favourite ministers, a great minister of our generation, Minister Denise Ewart. Her sermon was titled, Sound the Alarm and Get in Position. Guys, I'm excited for this word. I want you to sit tight and we're going to go to her right now. My sermon today is going to be taken from Joel chapter 2. And if I was to give it a title, it would be Sound the Alarm and Get into Position. Sound the Alarm and Get into Position. Before I read the scripture that um, will work with my message, I just want to give you a little bit of history about Joel. Joel was one of the minor prophets that was called to Judah. His name means Yahweh is God. His prominent message to Judah was the day of the Lord is at hand but he wasn't talking to the heathen or those that did not know about God he was talking to the church at the time and in Joel chapter 1 I just want to go through some of the verses so you understand the devastation that was happening at the time in Joel 1 1 it said the word of the Lord came to Joel so this message that Joel gave was not from his emotion it was not from his intellect. It was not from knowledge. It was a divine word commissioned by God for the people of Judah. In verse 2 it said, hear this ye old men and give ear. In other words, you better pay attention to this message because this message is vitally important. I believe he went to the old men first because with age comes wisdom. They too would have known Yahweh. They would have been brought up in a home that spoke of Yahweh. They would have known the principles and the holiness of Yahweh. So if the old wiser men can just grab a hold of Joel's message first. And then in verse 3 it says, make sure you tell your children and your children's children, even the baby that's sucking on the breast, you need to let them know because you're never going to have seen anything like this before and then in verse 4 Joel says that which the palmer worm has left has the locust eaten and that which the um, locust has eaten the canker worm has eaten and what the canker worm has left the caterpillar has eaten and as I read it, I said, Lord, those are all kind of locusts. So what's the difference? He said they're at different stages. So the first one, the palmer word, when I looked at the Hebrew word for it, it said gazam, which is to gnaw and to bite. A bit like the action of a mice. They nibble through things. He said that the palmer worm is going to be released. They're the ones that are at the larva stage. They're young. They're at the first stage of development. After that, he said, anything that the palmer worm left, the locust is going to come. The locust is the second stage. It now has wings and it's able to fly. When you look at the actions of the locust and how it eats, the jaw goes from side to side, which means it's grinding. This is not nibbling and gnawing. It's now grinding. The Hebrew word for locust is arbor, which means to be many. So the palmer worm has already done damage. But what has been left, the locust comes and he grinds it up. The third stage is that the canker worm then comes. The Hebrew for canker worm is yeleg, Y-E-L-E-G, which means to lick off, which means anything, any of the herd, any of the flock, any of the seed, the wheat, the t everything that was left. The canker worm has now come and licked off what was grinded up. And God said, that's still not enough. After they have done that, then the caterpillar, the final stage, the Hebrew word chasil means to completely devour and consume. The caterpillar is going to come and it's going to consume everything. It then goes on to say that the drunkards are going to weep. The drunkards, they represent the, the family. 
fanciness of life. Um, because wine is an expensive thing. Wine is something that you have if, you know, you're doing okay. The drunkard's problem is that they have overindulged in that finer thing in life. So it's really talking about the luxury of life. It then goes on to mention that the priests, uh, they're not going to have no meat to be able to do a meat offering. There'll be no grapes in the vine. They won't be able to offer a, a drink offering in the temple, which means even worship had been affected in this season. He goes on to say the farmers, the husbandmen and the vine dressers, you need to howl. The word howl means to have a loud, prolonged, mournful cry. A cry of distress, a cry of pain and a cry of rage. Why? The wheat and the barley and the harvest of the field has been completely perished. My God. The priest couldn't go in the temple and do a sin offering, which means the people were bearing the brunt of their sins. The farmers, they couldn't give their first fruit and pay their tithes to God. There was nothing. The land had been completely demolished. Turmoil. My God. Joel never ever tells us in detail what Judah had done wrong. But whatever it was, the hand of God was against him, them. In Deuteronomy, it tells us that if you listen and observe and do, you will get blessed. If you don't listen and you don't observe and you don't do, you'll be cursed. Deuteronomy says, you'll be blessed in the city and in the field. Everywhere you go will be blessed. Your field will be blessed. The ground will be blessed. The cattle and the kine and the flocks will be blessed. The polar opposite to what was happening in Judah. Verse 13 then tells us, gird yourself and lament ye priests. How ye ministers at the altar. Come lie all night. For the meat offering and the drink offering has been withheld. My God. Worship has been abandoned. And then we go to Joel 2, which is where my message starts. Joel 2 and verse 1. And then down to verse 15 to 19. Bear with me, sorry, I've missed the scripture. Thank you, Jesus. Joel 2 and verse 1 reads, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And then down to verse 15, he says again, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, Call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them wherefore should they say among the people where is their God then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people yea the Lord will answer and say unto his people behold I will send you corn and wine and oil and ye shall be satisfied therewith and I will no more make you a reproach approach among the brethren. Father, in the name of Jesus, even as your word will go forth tonight, Father God, I pray that the anointing of God will be upon the word, 
that the hearers of the word will hear what the Spirit is saying at this time and in this season. Sound the alarm and get into position. Amen. Zion symbolizes the church. The Bible tells us that judgment will begin in the house of God. He said, blow the trumpet. In other words, raise an alarm. Make an bring things to attention. He said, sanctify a fast, choose a day, humble yourself, come before the God. This has to be a sacrificial offering. Call a solemn assembly. In other words, it's not a time to be rejoicing and laughing. He wants us to be sober-minded, to be focused, to be serious. Gather the people, boy, girl, old, young, infant, child that is suckling. Sanctify the con congregation, which means all those that gathered had to be sanctified. They had to be focused. They had to realize what this was really about. He said in verse 217, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep before the porch and the altar. There's something about the porch and the altar. In between the two was where the priests would go and they would make intercession for the people. The people that were outside of the temple were able to look through and see the porch area. It was close enough for them to hear when the priest was shouting, Lord have mercy on them. They would have heard it and it was close enough to the brazen altar that stood before the porch. Joel said the ministers and the priests need to go between the porch and the altar and begin to weep. What are they going to weep and say? The scripture says, let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine inheritance to reproach, that the people should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is your God? What was that verse really telling us? What it was saying is, Lord, we're coming back into position. We're refocusing. We're going to find your altar. And we're going to position ourselves at your altar. For Father, our success is your success. Our failure is God's failure. We're your people, Lord. And if the people out there don't see you defending us, they're going to wonder what's happened to the covenant people. Has God changed? Has his promise to the covenant people changed? No, but the people had moved from their position. So Joel's message from God was get back into position because there is an alarm going in the spirit realm. When we abandon the altar, God cannot defend us. When we abandon the altar, we leave ourselves open to judgment. When we abandon the altar, we invite ridicule from the heathen and from our enemies. When we abandon the altar, God's divine provision, sorry, is cut off. Completely cut off. But when the people gathered and the priest went and began to weep, and intercede God said I will be jealous for this land and my mercy will go out to the people they returned to their right position just taking my time bear with me in 2nd Chronicles 8 and verse 12 it says, then Solomon offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the porch. The space between the porch and the brazen altar was 20 cubits. There's 18 inches in one cubit. So the 20 times the 18 made 360 inches. That's just over nine meters. That's approximately 29 feet in length. That was the space of the porch and the altar of God. The Hebrew word for altar means to slay or to slaughter. 
the altar was made of acacia wood, which signifies the humanity of man. And it was overlaid in bronze. Bronze signifies the judgment of sin. At the altar was four horns. Those horns were on either corner of the altar. You may be calling 1 Kings Adoniah when Solomon was seeking to kill him. He ran into the temple and he grabbed hold of the horn of the altar. And he pleaded for mercy. For as long as Adoniah remained at the horn of the altar, he could not die. Solomon and his army could not take him out. No one dared to go near the altar and take life. Because the altar represented mercy. And for as long as he was clinging to mercy, mercy spoke on Adonai's behalf. In Leviticus 1.9, it says the sacrifices that took place on the brazen altar went up to God like a sweet savour. What does that mean? It means that when the incense and the smell went up to God, it evoked something in God. It brought God back to remembrance. It made him remember the covenant that was made. The brazen altar. Brethren, if we are not living at that place of sacrifice, at that altar, Praying, holding on to the horn, begging God for mercy. We are in trouble. There are things that is due to come. God doesn't want the church to be judged. And he's saying, church, some of you have come out of position. He's saying, if you could just get back to the place of sacrifice. If we're not living at the altar, there's no fire. If there's no fire, there's no hot coals. If there's no hot coals, it means that there's no prayer. The reason why we will know is because it was the priest's job to take the hot coals from the brazen altar, from the place of sacrifice, and take it forward to the golden altar, the altar of incense. That was where the aroma would go up into the atmosphere. It was the coals from the brazen altar that sustained the golden altar. So when we're not praying, there's no incense. When we stop praying, the incense stops rising. When the incense stops rising, it's an indication that we've left the place of sacrifice. When we leave the place of sacrifice, it means we're relying on our humanity. Humanity has limitations. When we leave the place of sacrifice, it means we've decided we no longer need a covering. When we leave the place of sacrifice, it means we, we're saying we don't need any safety. We're okay. When we leave the place of sacrifice, what we're really saying is, I might be here and I might look the part, but in my heart I'm backslidden. You see, sometimes we assume the backslider is the one that's leaving church and going to the clubs. Or having an extramarital affair and you kind of, they're a backslider. But a backslider is anyone that doesn't want to be in the presence of God. Anyone who is distanced from the presence of God, it means that in their heart, they have backslidden. So when we choose to live outside of the area of the brazen altar, the sacrificial lamb, who is now Jesus Christ, when we decide to live outside of that, we're saying, God, I don't need you. If you notice, 
when the enemy wants to attack you or attack the church, what does he remove? Prayer. It's the first thing. Why? He understands that for as long as you're praying, it means you understand the need for mercy. It means you understand the need for the covenant God. It means you understand the need of sacrifice. It means you understand that the incense has to keep going. And for as long as the incense is going, God cannot resist you. He cannot resist your aroma. It's what he seeks for. That's why he says, don't let the fire go out. But the first thing the enemy wants to do is make the fire go out. Because he knows that when the aroma stops, it means that God can't locate you. Ah, he had the same agenda with Eve. He's just using a different strategy. When Eve sinned, he wanted them to be removed from the presence of God. And God came in the garden looking. God came looking for that time when they were supposed to meet with him. And he said, where art thou? But there's no garden of Eden now. So what the enemy does, he says, I will let prayerlessness come. Because for as long as they're not praying, it means they're not communing with God. It means that he's looking for their incense. He's trying to sniff and smell them. And he's saying, where are you? And we're just assuming, I'm not praying. But in the spirit realm, it's deeper than that. We're saying we're self-sufficient. We don't need a sacrifice. We're saying, I am like God. I can do this on my own. Did he not say that to Eve? And you shall be like God's. When we decide to ignore the altar of God, we are saying, God, I have decided I don't need a covering. I don't need mercy. I'm okay. When we decide not to pray, God says we are going into the area of idolatry. He said to the priest, my God, weep between the porch and the altar. God needs us to get back into position because the day of the Lord is at hand. Richard, there are many things that God wants us to do. Many blessings, many giftings, many anointings. It's sin us, it's sin us. But if you're prayerless, that very gifting can become a curse. The land that they had that should have been a blessing and provide harvest dried up. Why? They had departed from the presence of God. Everything was dried up. They said the locusts even went to the fig tree and devoured the bark. The branches ended up being white. In the Bible, the fig tree represents the church. It meant that the covering had been removed. It said that the bride will put on sackcloth and weep for her husband. God saw the church in those days now as his bride. She wept because the husband had left because of her idolatry. Without living at the altar, saints, we will be gifted, but we will lack the anointing. It's the anointing that we need in this season without the anointing my God we will see devastation devastation but what I love about God is that whenever the people humble themselves whenever the people come back to him whenever the people reposition themselves his nature his faithfulness will always speak. 
when the incense goes up and he smells the incense, it evokes a memory in God. A memory that says, this is my covenanted people. These are the people that I will defend. These are the ones that I have chosen. These are the ones that will go with me to the very end. When I smell the incense, I am compelled. I am compelled. I am forced to do what they ask me to do. I have no choice. Why is it that we see prayer as a burden and not one of the greatest privileges given to any of God's creation. Do you know the angels can't tell God what to do? The sun, the moon, the stars, the sea, the ocean can't tell God what to do. Satan can't tell God what to do. But God says, if you come to the altar, you can command ye, me. What a privilege he has given to the church. What a privilege. Because when you cling to the altar, there is something that goes up before God. Do you know even in the demonic realm, they know if you live at the altar. I cannot tell you how many times in a deliverance session, we will hear a demon, a pastor and the team can testify. We have come on assignment to kill her. We have received payment to kill him. And pastor will challenge. So why are they still alive? Why are they not dead? Because she prays. What is that demon telling us? That demon is saying, Sister Liette, this woman and this man refuses to leave the altar. She refuses. She refuses. She's holding on to the horn of the altar. And for as long as she is there, mercy. God is compelled to defend the individual that is at the altar. I believe my mother, love her so much, understood the principle of the altar. From childhood memory up until this day, 6 a.m. till 7 a.m., 12 midday till 1 a.m in the afternoon, 6 p.m. till 7 p.m. My mother is on her knees at the altar. Ah, and she's saying, God, ah, please change my generation. Change my generation. Father, I speak into my children's life, into the children's children. She has spoken into generations to come. Do I doubt that when my mother was passed, if God tarries up to the 10th, 20th and 100th generation to come, we'll be children of God serving in ministry. I don't doubt it because my mother understood that for as long as she clings to the altar, God is compelled and forced to do as she has asked and no matter what she has seen in life, no matter what blessings has come her way, she's never felt she's self-sufficient to dare move from the altar. No matter what great things she's seen happen in her lineage, she's never felt confident enough to say, I'm going to erase and move myself from the altar. Do you know I was speaking to her yesterday and she was saying, Denise, you know, I never knew there were workmen coming to the house because um, some of the brothers have organized some stuff and they came came at midday, which was my prayer time. She said, Denise, I knew that for as long as they were doing what they were doing in the house, I wouldn't have been able to focus and do my prayer properly. So I left it. She said when it was time for bed, she had got herself ready for bed. She said, Denise, I lied in the bed. And she said, as I lied, she said an agitation took hold of her. She said she realized that she had missed her midday sacrifice at 
the altar. And where I, and I admit, would have said, I'll do it another day. Mom, at the age of 90, said, Denise, I got up out of the bed. I went on my knee and said, Jesus, I'm here to offer my sacrifice. What am I saying? If you understand the privilege of staying at the altar, We spoke of evangelist Zachary earlier. I have no doubt he stayed at the altar. You see the awesome things our bishop and pastor does. Stayed at the altar. If you want success in your life, go for it. Go to university. Get your master's. Get your degree. Pursue life. But whilst in your pursuit, stay at the altar. The altar, the altar. God says we are now priests. No one's doing this on our behalf. God expects us to make that sacrifice. Forget how tired you are. How many times do you have a meeting at work? You don't wanna go to the meeting, but it's been diarized. Your Outlook calendar tells you you have a 12 o'clock meeting. You can't go to your boss and say, I'm not feeling the meeting today. Or I haven't cooked dinner for the family yet. Boss expects you to be at the meeting at midday. When we decide to live at the altar, nothing, nothing must remove us. Last night, I'm not ashamed to say, I was downstairs and I wept. I cried because I realized I had abandoned the altar. Days when I don't pray. I took to God, always speaking to God, don't get me wrong. But the priest had a formula of how they presented the sacrifice at the altar. Sister Petrina, the thing affected me so much. I was on the sofa lying down and started to cry and say, God. And God said, would the priest lie so casually on the sofa and offer a sacrifice? up pastor the tv was on and it was on low and as I'm saying oh God I heard God say if I don't have your undivided attention you're not really at the altar so I got the remote and I turned the tv off my God oh God oh God and it's like he was showing me things about myself that made me realize when you come to the altar of God, you don't come anyhow. He hasn't actually changed every principle that was in the Old Testament is relevant today. They had to find a spotless animal to be sacrificed. Jesus became the spotless lamb. But the principle hasn't changed. He said, Denise, when you are coming into position, come properly. A fear gripped me. Not a fear that made me scared, but a, a holy godly fear. That last night when I went to my bed, I put my phone to alarm for 5.30. I said, I must get up and go to the altar. It just happened that I woke up at 4.30, went to the bathroom, and I heard God says, I'm waiting for you at the altar. I had 
had to go downstairs at 4.30 a.m. this morning and find the altar. Sound the alarm, I heard God say. And tell them, run back to position. There is a judgment coming on this land. There is a judgment coming. And when the judgment comes, the church will be judged first. Because we had the privilege to change it. We had the privilege to change the mind and the hand of God. There was no wine, there was no wheat, there was no corn, there was no flock. But when they came back to the altar, God said, then was I jealous. And he returned to them. He said, your former rain and latter rain is going to come in just one month. They didn't have to wait. He said, the corn is going to come back. I'm going to restore the years. Facts will be overflowing. Flour will fill the floor. Your baskets and your storehouses will be full. All they had to do to reverse the judgment of God was get back into position. In Joel 2, in this same scripture, it says, render your heart and not your garment. And I was saying, God, I always used to use that as my get out clause for certain things. You know, when you're young in Christ and a bit rebellious. <laughs> and uh, my pastor Patterson, uh, he was really strict on certain things. And I always say, well, the Bible says, render your heart and not your garment. So I'm okay to wear this and do that. Yesterday, God said to me, when I say rend your heart and not your garment, garment is what is on the outside. He said, Denise, you always come to church looking well presented. On the outside, you're well presented. But I don't want that. I want your heart. If you really have a heart for me, you'll stick by the altar. Because it was the altar and the sacrifice of Jesus that has made me who I am today. If I really have a heart for God and I really love God, the altar and the horn is what I hold to. We can be destiny changers. We can have businesses as Brother Richard said. We can do great exploits for God. And God wants us to do it. And he says, yes, yes. If you stick at the altar, if you let your incense rise, if you let your incense rise, everything that I've given to you will be birthed. But when we remove ourselves from prayer and we tell God we're all self-sufficient, all self-knowing, we're like gods. That very gift can destroy us. How many awesome men of God have you seen devastated and lost their way? People are shocked. It makes the news, it makes the media. Man of God, X, Y, and Z. Gifted. But no position at the altar. The altar is a place of humility, of submission. You don't do what you want at the altar. At the altar you do as God wants you to do. A very sober message, but a needful message at this time. There are some things that God wants to give you. There are some things God wants to change for you. There are some blessings God wants to pour out for you. And all he's saying is, don't forsake the altar. Not every trouble that comes your way is of the enemy. Some trouble is to lead you back to the altar. When trouble comes, everyone remembers how to pray. When problems arise, everyone knows how to set their alarm to pray. 
God is saying, don't let trouble come. There are things he wants to do and there are some aromas that he says is missing. Some of our young people, gifted, anointed, remnants in this end times, lost their position. God says, come on church, let's gather. Let's bring an assembly together. Let's take this thing serious. Let's come with a solemn face and a heart attitude and let us weep at the altar. Let us stand. I'm going to hand over to pastor at this time. Wow, what an amazing message from Minister Denise Ewart. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to know more about what we've got going on here at BCM, go to the link that is showing on the screen right now. We can't wait to see you next week Sunday at 2.50. Take care.